Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Ritesh. And I'm Norul. Uh, we are web developers. We are associated with CreateSpace. It's an investment and wealth management bank. In addition, we'll also represent a tech knowledge exchange uh, community here. It's called Tech Talks. And uh, we are here to discuss and share our knowledge on progressive web apps. Uh, the agenda would largely cover the basics of it, some building blocks, and demonstration and hold around it. But before we talk about any of that, uh, I would like to uh, talk a bit about uh, the various assessments. Essential various assessments, uh, food, heat, water to drink, place to live, essentially. And above all, a mobile phone for everything else. That essentially how the life is. Uh, there are over 5 million applications, uh, uh, mobile apps, available on the app stores across iOS and Android. And then uh, we are, um, as for the server, you will spend almost 4 hours a day on a daily basis on your mobile phones. 87% of that time is something that people spend on mobile apps, and another 70% is something that uh, they serve through mobile browsers. So that's essentially interesting. Mobile apps, the world of mobile apps, is everything that you can change, right? Uh, be it social networks, uh, be it uh, uh, banking services, healthcare, different apps. It's quite an interesting part of the world. And all the uh, interesting things that this comes uh, back to it. Uh, it's expected that by 2021, the total mobile app revenue will go to 6.3 trillion. That's huge, isn't it? Uh, but uh, the app makers who are highly invested in developing mobile applications uh, have basically been challenged these days over the past three, four years. Uh, uh, before I take you to that challenge, uh, I want you to imagine for a moment what if your mobile did not really have that interconnection, maybe for say three hours, or if had a different kind of application? What would that be like? Is it fast? Yes. Mobile internet speed, yeah. Yeah. It's around 55 Mbps, <coughs> megabits per second. That essentially means you download your favorite app, it will probably take you five seconds or so. Uh, I was visiting some neighboring countries uh, over the past couple of weeks, and uh, this is the mobile speed that I get. Uh, for download, I can see 1.4 megabits per second and upload to my What does the definition mean? Uh, if you're downloading an app that is say 60 MB, uh, or less than a Facebook, then if you're downloading Facebook, the less than a Facebook, it will take you 7 to 8 minutes. What do you wait for that? And uh, so, yeah, I tried my luck downloading Facebook, eventually gave up. Uh, it's uh, something that really tries your patience. Another figure that essentially comes out is that uh, with mobile apps and the things on the mobile, our patience is really short. Uh, you would expect probably a screen to load for uh, 6 to 10 seconds. Beyond that, uh, another figure sort of says that uh, uh, for every second lost, a mobile app a developer or a company loses 7% of customer conversion chances. That essentially is huge. So what essentially leads to this problem? Uh, there are some challenges. Uh, most of uh, the countries uh, here, what we are getting is 55 Mbps, but the majority of the countries, the internet speed is 22 Mbps on average. And the lowest uh, that you would notice is 6 Mbps, but that essentially gets distributed further. And 60% of the mobile viewers are on 2G. So that essentially is something when we see the download speed for 2G network is 0.0 Mbps. It's much, much lower. So that essentially uh, does not help the business. It's something that uh, mobile interaction is not affected, as you would expect apps to be. You expect apps to be interactive. You expect them to have a great user experience. But that essentially something lacks. And uh, the disk storage is another uh, uh, constraint that essentially does not allow uh, you to keep a lot of apps that you're interested in. 
Uh, another figure that came out was that for, on an average, the users keep uh, around 30 apps on uh, their mobile. Of which they only use four. And the first one takes almost 46% of the time. And over a period of time, the uh, size increases. Because of these heavy apps, they keep on deleting it. So that essentially is uh, 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 so another alternative to that is actually look at the mobile web, mobile browser and accessing sites for that. But they have their own challenges. It does not give the same experience as uh, a mobile app would give. It's not very interactive. Some websites are not responsive at all. Uh, they don't have the uh, core features a native app provides uh, uh, to interact with, say, uh, engage with the user, have push notifications, have things that essentially enables and binds the users uh, of mobile to the app. It has great reach. Uh, it's much more easier to find a mobile web application or uh, just go through browser and search through an app. But it is not something that is easily accessible. It's great reach, but it lacks on the richness. It lacks on the user experience. It has no push notifications. And it uh, does not have offline access. So there are lots of uh, issues that you would see with the mobile uh, web while accessing websites through your mobile. Uh, but uh, in the same um, um, series, there was essentially a study or a probably a case that happened around three years back. Uh, there was this um, e-commerce giant in India named Flipkart. They uh, took a decision uh, to, in 2015, they said they would move all their business to app only. They were enthusiastic with, that, with more and more mobile consumers coming people by mobile phones. It would be good to consolidate their effort on the development of mobile apps and broad and iOS and they shut down their website. The effect was that within six months, the top uh, e-commerce giant was replaced by two more. Uh, it was uh, 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 the rivals got there, uh, had uh, taken over them. And then essentially, they also looked a good market share. Uh, at the last, they had to sort of relaunch their website. Uh, but something was different this time. It was not the same website they launched. It was named uh, Flipkart Lite. And they marketed it, and uh, the technology that uh, was publicized behind it was called PWA, Progressive Web Apps. It is something which was probably 10 uh, uh, times lesser in size of the actual uh, Flipkart uh, uh, iOS and Android app, much faster and much more engaging. They reported a profit of 64% within a month of that. Similarly, there were a lot of case studies that uh, came after that. AliExpress, adopting PWA, we have the new users of 104%. Uber has an essentially for even on 2G connection, they have a very fast uh, connection and it takes less than 3 seconds to load the app. Book my show, Twitter. There are over 100 stories that you can sort of really go and uh, find at PWA apps. Uh, but what essentially is this PWA after all? People talk a lot, it's kind of a buzz for these days. What essentially it means and what it carries? It's something which is a very simple website as you would know. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all that is has with a few special features. It's something that's intended to combine the best of web with the best of native apps. How does it do that? What is it something that makes us engaging and yet a great experience of uh, like an native app? Let's discover that. Okay. Thank you, Ritesh. As Ritesh pointed out, progressive web apps are trying to retain the best parts of web. What are those? Like frictionless software distribution. You don't need to download an app. And discoverable by the search engines. And linkable and shareable. Those are the best parts of web. And at the same time, trying to improve the capabilities which were lagging for a long time. So some of the things like offline experience, background sync, and push notifications. So let's see, before we dive in, what is the features of a PW app? Let's see a video of existing PWA by Flipkart, e-commerce giant from, okay, I'll just. Yeah. Before we dive in, uh, let's see a demo of existing PW app by e-commerce giant Flipkart, and they are the one of the early adopters of PW. Okay, go to the Flipkart website. There's option to add it to home screen. 
let's move on to the home screen here you go you, it looks like a native icon native app icon you launch it i think it was trying to purchase a tv so we just recorded it television premium i think he wants to filter because he sees so many things here choose one is small tv just some samsung and panasonic and experience is seamless it looks like a native app but it's just a web app okay now you see a few results okay you can view the video pictures is looking at a cold tv yeah looking at the details okay setting to the cot perfect i think he don't want to order right away he wants to wait and look at other options <laughs> so it goes back to the main screen yeah that's it how does it feel you can add it to the home screen it exactly looks like a native app and then you just tap on it and then it opens in a separate window it's not like a browser window you don't see address bar or navigation buttons it's a native app window and then you can browse seamlessly and then you should be able to purchase it in a short amount of time similar to native apps okay now let's look at the features of pwa your web app has to be fast integrated reliable and engaging in google they call it fire so let's look at each of them fast your app has to be really really fast there is a survey which says that uh, 53% of your user will abandon your site if it takes more than 3 seconds to load that's a lot 53% of the users so your app has to be really really fast even for the first load and the subsequent visits there are some technology to make it faster for the subsequent visits but even for the first load it has to be really really fast the next point is integrated your app has to feel integrated within the platform let's say that android or ios they have to treat your app on par with the native app so it should be able to find your app in the home screen and also in the top switcher and also in the settings wherever you want to see all the apps pwa should be listed along with the native apps and let's say you want to configure permission for your app it should be in the same place as you do it for your native app and android already does a good job of uh, integrating on treating uh, pwa as an as, as along with the native apps and in ios also catching up in ios also you can add it to home screen you can launch it as a standalone window and then it supports all the latest functionalities the next point is reliable as it is pointed out uh, the internet connection there is also one of the services that 63% of the users mobile users are in 2g network so your app has to deal with the connection intermittent connection problem or it has to be connectivity independent you should graciously handle all those uh, connectivity issues and then you should provide offline experience and then sync it whenever is possible engaging so your app should live in the home screen and should be able to launch it by a tap of a finger and then it should provide immersive uh, full screen experience and also you should be able to re-engage the users with a push notification which was not there in the web application for a long time okay apart from all four fast integrated reliable and engaging there is one more which is very important it should be progressive we keep talking about progressive web application what does progressive means your app should work for every user irrespective of them browser version or device capability that means you enable this feature progressively depends on the device capability or browser's capability if the user device doesn't support it you have to provide a fallback mechanism 
You should not isolate any user just because they use this device or this browser. After all, web is all open and inclusive. Let's move on. So now we have seen there is a need for PWA and what are the features. Now uh, let's go into the building blocks or technologies which enables us to build PWA. These are the two things, web app manifest and service worker. What is web app manifest? This is the one which enables your web app to be added to the home screen or installed. Service worker, this enables you to achieve offline capability, background sync and push notification. Let's see what is web app manifest. Your web app has to tell the browser or operating system a little bit more information so that they can treat your web app as a PWA. The first thing you have to do is, in, the, in your index.html, you link that manifest.json file. You just tell that the file it is. And the manifest.json is the file which tells that little bit more information about your web app. So let's look at the manifest.json. So you have a short name. That is the name which is displayed on your mobile home screen. And you have icons. So you have, as per Google, it's best practice to provide at least 192 by 192 and 512 by 512. And you have to provide their corresponding icons or images. And the browser will choose based on the user's device. So it also scales up or scales down based on the device resolution. And I'll start the URL. This is the URL it will be hit when the user taps on the home screen, launches your PWA app. The display, uh, that is important. The display, uh, it says standalone. This is the one which makes your app launched in a separate screen, like a standalone screen. Uh, it's sort of a traditional uh, browser, but browser window. So if you put display as a browser, it will launch in a regular browser. So what are those? Theme color and background color. Any guess? When you launch from the home screen, before the first home screen comes, there is a splash screen, similar to app. So normally it has the name of your app and white background. So you can customize that using this theme color and background color. So that's all you need to do in order for your web app to be added to the home screen and the icon should look like a native app. Okay. Chrome goes one step further. In our Flipkart example, we manually went to the options and added to home screen. What Chrome does is, Chrome checks your, when you are launching your web app, Chrome checks whether it's meeting all the criteria of uh, PWA. If it meets, and if the users are visiting your site for more than 30 seconds, they will automatically bring up this prompt at the home screen. So this is not coming from the web app, it's coming from Chrome. The user just need to tap on it at the home screen, boom, it goes to the home screen. This is the current behavior till the latest version of Chrome and they are going to change it in the next version. Why? Any guess? Why are they not doing it anymore? Okay. So let's say uh, Radius is buying the TV uh, and then he is in the payments page entering the credit card details, suddenly this pop-up comes. It will distract the user. So for that, what uh, they are going to do from the next version of the Chrome is they give a control to the developer. The event will still be fired, but developers can catch it and display it whenever they want. Let's say in this case, once you are done with the purchase, users are happy, then the, we can put a button at the home screen and the user can add it. So now the developer has the full control from Chrome 68, I think. Okay. Let's move on. Service worker. How many of you heard about service worker before? Okay, a few. Okay. Service worker is a heart of uh, PWA. It's a web worker which runs in the background. It's separate from the main UI thread. And what it provides is using this, you can achieve the offline access, push notification, and background sync and all those additional features. And there's an important note here, your site should be served via HTTPS. Because 
using service worker the developer can control can take full control of all the network requests you are making we can intercept all the network requests and the developer can decide what to do with it that's a powerful feature that's why it has to be served via https okay i think the next uh, we will see we will go in depth of service worker how to use service worker to achieve uh, offline access background sync and push notification i will give it to ritesh to demonstrate those thanks sir uh, service worker as rules is pretty interesting um, there was two things that point out specifically uh, first thing is that service worker is independent uh, of your web app that means it runs of course it has an association with it but it has its own life cycle it does not depend on your app to run so it does not mean if your app is not running it will not run it runs though it has a life cycle and it has properties associated with it second thing is that it intercepts every request that you are sending in your domain uh, you could of course scope it but interception means that whatever uh, resource you are uh, trying to source from uh, uh, server is something goes through service worker uh so there uh, comes all the possibilities that you could really apply in your web application when you are able to uh, judge what is the user's behavior and how do you essentially modify it and how you could leverage it with the service that you are trying to provide in the service worker life cycle uh, as what you have to start with is to register a service worker to your application so in your javascript as you sort of can launch you essentially have to check if service worker is something that is supported by your browser different browser have different behaviors as of now today i think all the browsers do support a uh, uh, service worker but till recent past it was not there but it is still sort of in uh, it's safe to uh, check that if the service worker is something that is supported by the browser how you essentially do that is to sort of check specifically is service worker the keyword supported by the navigator navigator is the representation of your browser if it is supported uh, then you need to register it what you see here in this statement is we are saying for the navigator register the service worker which is available at this given path and it's a promise once it gets resolved uh, we are just putting in a message the service worker is registered successfully in case of error you essentially get to see an error uh, which essentially is sort of an okay but there is one more thing that you could do with it you could scope it if you have essentially big application and you want certain uh, part of your application to have access to the service worker or to do something special with it you might be interested to only cache the static part of your application or anything that probably deals with confidential data something that is associated with dynamically changing data uh, which needs to be uh, remain fresh you may not want to sort of use service worker so you sort of choose what is the data that you want to uh, keep uh, available offline and try to scope it accordingly scope essentially is uh, something where you could define the subfolder or you can place service worker in that directory structure so that whatever is below that directory structure uh, service worker will be available applicable to that uh, after this after registration what happens what is the life cycle of registration as soon as you put in uh, register service worker it goes through these stages install and activate let's see what install looks like in uh, service worker uh, your sw.js file which is a service worker has these uh, uh, two events that are uh, involved in the activation and usage of service worker the first one is the install as soon as you have installed or executed that step the first event gets called which essentially has a reference of wait until a promise is over um, as we do this the action on install is a script that you want to write or things that you want to do when the installation is happening once the installation is completed successfully uh, then there are two uh, possibilities that could happen let's see uh, let's say that this application is being launched for the first time in the browser when it is launched for the first time and there is no history of this application after install immediately active is uh, called activate is essentially that it is used for cache management or any actions that you want to do when uh, a new service worker is getting set up on your web browser um uh, what essentially could happen here is uh, i'll get in a while uh, but the next thing uh, the second point of which you were mentioning about uh, interception interception is something that happens through another api fetch uh, event uh, in, so this event you could sort of listen to all the requests that the client is making uh, 
uh, to the server and intercept this and try uh, it can either sort of forward it or just modify the response and use it. Now let me get back to what happens on the first install versus the subsequent install. This is what we just saw. Uh, something that eventually happens is the first install when the uh, browser is open for the first time, all the information is downloaded, you have it in your local machine, and the service worker is installed and activated. But if uh, you are launching it for the second time, there might be a behavior that service worker might have executed. It might have cached a few files, it might have cached HTML files, CSS, some JavaScript. That might be something that you may want to reuse. In case your browser is open, you have been looking at this application. Now, if you have, just imagine this, you are working on a mobile app. Suppose you have opened Instagram, you are looking at it, and some uh, 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 update comes from the app store. What would happen? Would it immediately be applicable in case you have put on your updates on? Or it will be applicable whenever you have grabbed your connection and once you close the application? It will probably run in the background. It won't impact what you are currently seeing. Same is uh, uh, the fundamentals here that are being carried forward to progressive web apps. That if the browser is open, or any, so in case you are uh, surfing it through multiple uh, tabs, and in multiple tabs you have uh, uh, your application open, and in case there is a server update and it gets downloaded, the service worker does not get activated immediately. It waits. It waits until all the browsers are closed because it does not want to ruin the experience that the, uh, the, uh, the customer is, happen, uh, uh, is having. What kind of different experience could be? You might have changed the whole CSS, you might have probably downloaded new files, the so look and feel, or the behavior might have totally changed. So you don't want to give surprises or other shocks to the uh, to consumers. So service worker waits. There is a running service worker and another service worker that essentially is waiting for all the problems to pose. There is, of course, an override to escape them. Uh, if uh, at the install time you put self or escape waiting, then essentially uh, the waiting time for the next service worker to take effect is sort of an overridden and it gets immediately applicable. And your service workers are essentially active. Uh, now let me get to the next part which has to do with what we do in the service worker. In the install and fetch, uh, install and activation, there are certain uh, uh, execution that there is activity that happens. The primary activity that happens here is about caching. Caching the response so that even, um, as uh, Nuru mentioned, uh, a primary feature of your VWA is the capability or to work offline. In case uh, uh, there is no interpretation or there is intermittent failure and everything, your mobile apps work fine, but your website doesn't work. All you get to do is probably play with the dinosaur. So, to uh, add that capability to the mobile apps, is this uh, uh, a new feature that allows you to sort of cache the responses. That essentially is enabled through cache API, which is associated with service worker. The way it works is, uh, it contains uh, two elements. One is the uh, cache storage, which is a collection of the cache elements. And then is the cache object, that is individual cache, uh, and uh, which would essentially contain a key value pair according to a certain behavior, a certain functionality that you want to. Uh, and let's see how it essentially looks like. Uh, in the install, as you said that uh, in the last screenshot, I showed you that there was something that we are doing here. I have added uh, a cache element here. I have given a name, pw-cache. I have some files to cache, which includes my HTML, it includes the JavaScript, and install includes this file. What I do in the install is, I open the caches object. This is, and then find the cache uh, with this name. If it is not found, it will be created. If it is found, uh, then my promise would return me that cache. Add on is something that whatever files I have defined here in files to cache, those would be downloaded and cached in the cache store within the web browser. Similarly, after I have sort of an installed it, the next thing that I would essentially do is, is to intercept uh, the behavior and then fetch it, which uh, you can see here. Or uh, what's happening is that as and when you are uh, raising the server request, uh, we cache the URL and then we respond. If there is an entry in the cache for your request, it will be served from the cache. If it cannot find an entry in the cache, it uh, will raise a fetch request to the server. That will be forwarded as it is. This is the most oversimplified example of fetch, though there are essentially variables to it. 
and the other strategies that you can apply when you are applying caching mechanism to it. Uh, these are, they are, I think, over 10 different variations of applying caching, but these are probably the most prominent uh, and the easier to essentially understand. Network only, cache only, cache for network falling back to back, and then caching in the network. Let's see what it looks like. When you say network only request is just like any HTTP request. You uh, raise a request, it goes to the service worker, service worker just forwards it to the uh, uh, service worker just forwards it to the server, and then it comes back with the response. It's plain and simple. There is no raw service worker; it's just a forwarder, and nothing gets cached. And this is how uh, the code is actually looks like. Just respond with, just forward the call to fetch, uh, get the response, and uh, forward it back to the browser. Second strategy is caching only. In caching only, uh, the browser request raises a request, it goes to the service worker, service worker forwards it to cache only. If that cache element is available, it gets returned. If it is not available, nothing is essentially returned, but you do not go to the server. Where do you essentially use it? If you have data that does not change, you probably just have a static website that essentially just stays there, that data is not important, the updates are not essentially important, it's just there for you to use. So you probably don't want to do too many network requests for those kind of information. Because or are there are scenarios where the going to the network is costly, then caching locally. The third strategy and the most popular one is cache first and then network. What it means is from the browser when the request goes to the service worker, it's forwarded to the cache. If cache has the data, it returns the data. If cache does not have data, then it goes to the network. Uh, it comes back uh, to the service worker. Service worker cache it, puts it into the cache. Adds it because it's a request is in the domain it's in that region. So it will add, add to the cache for the future differences. And then that response essentially goes back to the browser. Uh, this is the cache first code. What we do here is we find in the cache first if the cache is, uh, object contains uh, that request then it uh, goes back with that response. If it does not, it goes to a fetch request, uh, gets the server response, open that cache, cache.put pushes it into the cache, and then it returns the server response to the browser. This is the third strategy. The next one is network first. That means that the request would first go to the network, and uh, these are essentially true when you, um, uh, there is a uh, you want to sort of give a preference to the server, uh, and then whatever essentially response come, you forward it to the cache. But you prefer to have fresh data. Add it back to the server and system. But this can really get nasty. Suppose if it happens that your browser shows you are connected to the internet, but it's a poor connection. You are neither connected nor disconnected. And you get an endless wait. So if you adopt this strategy, you have a chances of uh, long failure. Uh, you would keep on waiting, cache will not respond, fetch will not respond, it would be stuck. One alternative to that or rather uh, is to sort of put in timeout that you wait for a certain seconds. If it doesn't sort of respond, then you take an action whatever you want. This is the code for network first request. Similar, go fetch from the server first. If it is available, uh, put it to with the cache. If not, uh, then you just return whatever uh, is the response. Uh, the fifth and the last strategy on my slides is the fastest first. It's the race between cache and the network. Whatever can serve me first. So browser uh, sends a request. It's the collection of promises that goes both to the uh, to the network and to the cache. Whoever responds back, in the majority of the cases or almost always, cache will respond back because it's slow. So cache will come back with the response if it has, and it will forward to the browser. And if not, network essentially will come back and respond back to the browser. Uh, this is how uh, uh, this kind of mail would look like. You have all the promises, you have a promise for caches not match, and you have a promise for fetch currently. And then you try to resolve it, you add into a collection, and then you try to sort of uh, get it executed. As and when your responses are back, you reduce and you sort of see if they are into uh, a request from the cache. Uh, failure, it does not have it, looks up uh, to the network. If it's had, that uh, promise is result. Otherwise, if none of uh, passed uh, or rejection is held, then none of the promises written the result that you were looking for. This is largely all about caching. 
I have one more thing to cover as far as the offline K community is concerned, which is to do with the background sync. I'll uh, show you a quick video on the background sync and then let's see what essentially is happening here. Uh, this is essentially a uh, PWA and we're just trying to replicate what the WhatsApp chat looks like. We're probably having a conversation here and I go on an airplane mode, that means I have no internet connectivity whatsoever. And then I'm sending messages to so we are just uh, having a chit chat. But it indicates me that I'm offline. I don't have any internet connectivity. I keep on sending messages, it's fine. I don't care, I just close the application. Okay? And then I switch on my airplane mode. What would happen now is keep looking at the top bar. I receive the notification. Uh, the first notification, I click on that, it takes me back to the application, it opens the window, I go back to my background sync, and I see all the messages are posted. Can't imagine that with a website, which is not PWA. How does this happen? Let's have a quick look at the code. Um, it is achieved through IndexDB. IndexDB is another mechanism of storage, but it's much larger than cache. Cache, while it's key value layer, uh, IndexDB has an object structure, and it's used to store uh, data in much larger volume. Uh, again, in your uh, JavaScript, you will check if the IndexDB is something that is supported by your browser. Uh, by the way, if it is supported, then it works fine, otherwise we just throw that error. Uh, we initialize the DB, so we give it a name, the test DB, and uh, if it succeeds, then we get a DB connection object. And uh, if it's uh, after that, what gets executed is on upgrade DB. For the first time, it will always be executed. So subsequent time, you would see if there is any change, or you are updating the database schema, you are adding indexes, or doing anything else, then this uh, it will be executed. Otherwise, it won't be the subsequent times. Uh, once you initialize the DB. How do we essentially manage the synchronization? Because the background synchronization, I have taken an action, and that action is something my service worker needs to execute. So the strategy that I apply is that whatever action I have taken, I save it into my index DB, which is my local storage. Whenever the network of, uh, of connectivity is available, it will go to the server. For that to happen, we need to register an event to the service worker. It's called send. Navigated by service worker whenever it's ready. Then on the click of a button, I am uh, registering an event, uh, service worker registration, sync, register, and I am giving it a tag, which is called sync chat. And in the service worker, which you see at the bottom, uh, is the sync event. Uh, if my tag is this, I do certain action. I save the chat to the server. Now let's see how this essentially, what's inside this. Uh, when I uh, uh, Click on that add button, this is what I do. I open a transaction object. In the transaction object, I add the message, I add the sender, and I give a random key. After that, once that uh, transaction is successful, I'm just logging it, and I close the transaction. Index DB is largely all driven by transactions. After uh, this transaction is completed, whenever my uh, network connectivity is available, that sync even will fire automatically. And in the sync event, as I said, that uh, uh, what I'm doing is I'm picking it from a local cache, or cache in which I have stored in the previous transaction, and then I'm just quickly sending it to the server. And that essentially is like running the same screenshot, sorry. But uh, whatever you see here in the same chat to server is something that looks up to your local DB, picks it from there, calls the fetch request, saves it, and then issues the push notification. Uh, now let's see what the push notifications looks like and how they behave and how to enable them for receive notifications around this. Thank you. <coughs> push notifications are really great. You can re-engage the users, but also you should be very careful in using push notifications. Don't ever flood users with lots of notifications which are not relevant to them. Your push notifications should be timely, relevant, precise. Let's see a demo. I created this uh, single page uh, application to demonstrate this. This is a typical airline's booking. Uh, you have done your booking, you are in the confirmation page, 
and you see a button at the bottom, notify me for flight delays. Of course, everybody wants to get notified if there is a delay so that we can plan accordingly. Uh, let's play the video and see what happens when you click the notify button. Okay, user clicked it. Browser prompts whether you want to allow or block. Okay, user chooses allow. Then the subscription happens and you see a success message. <coughs> Thank you for subscribing to our notification. What I do behind the scenes is I wait for 10 seconds and then I send a, a notification to the client that flight has been delayed by uh, two hours. You see, there is notification on top. See, two hours has been delayed by two hours. So the notification is similar to the native notification. It comes in the notification tree. There is no difference between web app or PWA from native apps. Let's see how will we do it. Okay. So this is the steps required for push notification. Apart from client and server, uh, you see push always in the middle, which facilitates the push notification communication between client and server. Uh, the push service is specific to a browser. So Chrome will have its own push service deployed in the cloud and then Firefox will have its own push service. Uh, let's uh, look at the steps. So number one, subscribe. Uh, this is where when the user clicks the button, notify me for flight delays. And browser, before it sends the request, number one to the push service, browser intercept and then ask your permission. If you don't give permission, you won't get notified. So let's say you assume that you allowed it, then the request goes to the push service, and then you receive the subscription object back. This subscription object has all the information related to the client. Okay, the next step is you have to save the subscription object into the server, number three. Because the server is the one who is sending the notification, the server should know what are the clients I need to send the notification. So number three, save the subscription object to the server. And then, in our example, after 10 seconds, I send a message, flight has been delayed by two hours. So, sends the push message to the push service, number four, and the push service delivers to all the clients. In this case, it's client, the number five, delivers the push message. And when it comes to the client, your browser or app, no need to run, no need to be running your app or browser, you can close it. The service worker, which runs in a separate thread, which will be sleeping, which wakes up after it receives the push message, and that service worker is the one which sends the notification message to the operating system. Let's look at the code. Okay, this is for number one and two and three subscription process. On the client side, what happens is the first the line number sixteen registration of push managers on the side. That is the line when it executes browser. Uh, prompts in the power like whether you want to allow or uh, deny. Once the user allows, the promise goes off and you get the subscription object and then you are just posting the subscription object to the server. That's it. Okay, let's look at the server side. This is the endpoint subscribe which receives the subscription object and then it just so in the for now. Normally, you have to store it in a database so that you can send a notification to all the clients. For simplicity, you have to store it in a and after 10 seconds, you are sending a message to the client has been there for two hours. You are sending the subscription object. Let's see what is that uh, send notification method does. So, this is the second part. Now, the server sends the notification to the client. Just ignore the options for now. Just concentrate on the last line. Web push dot send notification. You are sending the object, the subscription object, and the message, and the options. The message is the actual uh, message, like your flight has been delayed. Okay. What is web push? It's a library, an open source library. You can do npm install, and then it will facilitate the communication between your server to the push service. It does all the encryption and connecting to the push service, calling the endpoint. So the web push actually has to call an endpoint in the push service and then deliver this message. So all these uh, uh, works are done by the web push for you, so you don't need to write your code. And just ignore the public key and private key for now. I will touch base on that. That's this for encryption. The client side. So your app is closed. 
or your browser is closed, nothing is running, but still your service worker will be sleeping, which can be woken up. So, what the full service comes, the service worker woke up, and then you can retrieve your message using event.data.text. Now you have an actual message. You are constructing an object which will be like what to display in the notification message. Then you are just calling self for registration or full notification. This is the name of the app and actual message you have the object. The object is icon also, so normally the notification you see icon of the app. And the message is the same. And even though wait until uh, that the service worker will wait until your uh, push message is delivered to the OS. Then it will go to sleep. Okay? So let's uh, touch base on the encryption part. Okay, so the push always has to know that whether the message or coming from the uh, right origin, right server. So for that, what we need to do is uh, there is something called packet keys, voluntary application identifier. So you have there is an npm library available to create the key. So you just install it and then issue a command create keys. It will create a private key and public key for you. What you do is you distribute the public key to the client. Keep the private key in the server confidentially. And when the client subscribes to the push service, it sends the public key so that the push service has the information about the public key. Whenever you send the, an actual message from the server, you have to encrypt using that private key. So that job is done by web push library for you. So you just need to provide the key, the web push will encrypt that message. So that when the message reaches the push service, it can verify, it can decrypt and make sure that it is coming from the right server. Okay, I think we are running out of time and quickly walk through the payments. Okay, so another pain point, uh, just not related to service worker, another pain point we face is uh, making payments through mobile web. Personally, I don't prefer to doing entering all the credit card details through a mobile web. We prefer app or desktop. So all the browser vendors are agreed to this. It's not a seamless experience and they started uh, addressing it. Uh, there is a W3C standard called Payment Request API and some of the browsers have already implemented it. So th these are the current problems of mobile payments. It's manual, TDS and you have to multi-touch and each and every website has their own way of capturing the credit card details. So they want to unify that. Okay, let's look at the video. This is Android. Uh, I just put a sample page, uh, I just created this example. If you are in box days, you enjoy it and you want to book for the next year ticket. And we have a super value discount 50%. So everything is there, you just need to pay. You just click the button pay, your credit card details are automatically picked up. You just need to hit pay. Just need to enter the CV. CVC. It's a big number, don't try. Okay, thank you for purchasing. That's it, just two taps. You just click pay and enter the CVV number and done. How does it happen? So, if you allow Chrome to store your credit card details and it will be with the browser, it will not be with this application. What this application do is rec call payment request.show, then the pop up is coming from the Chrome, not from my app. And from there, you can use the existing credit card or you have the option to enter the new credit card details also. And Chrome does all the basic validations of whether this number is from Visa or this number is from Master, and also it checks the expiry date. And then, if everything's fine, it passes the control back to the uh, our app. So let's quickly see the iOS one. Even you can do Apple Pay integration and Google Pay integration. So this is Apple Pay. Yes, okay. If you are interested in Apple Pay, you can see the search form and the payment goes. Okay, so let's quickly walk through the code. We have to construct uh, two objects. One is a supported payment, it's a array of objects. At the moment, I just have the basic card, which is credit card and debit card authentication. You provide supported networks, Visa, Master, and Amex. And the payment details, this is the actual amount you are going to charge. And this is the one which is displayed in the browser pop up. We need to tell the browser so that it can display this information. So you have to follow this format. Display items, virtual ticket price, discount, and total amount given. This will be displayed in the pop up. Ok, 
Okay? Very yes. simple. Pay in your payment records, you provide the supported payment numbers and the actual payment details. That's it. Payment records should show and Chrome does or browser does all the validation and if it is successful, you will get the results. You have to do the actual processing of the payment. You have to send this to your server, do the, all the payment processing. Once it is done, then you call the results for complete. That completes the payment flow. Okay, the last part, we have seen why we need PWA and what makes a good PWA and how to build PWA. Let's say we are done. How do you make sure that whatever I build, it, it matches or it satisfies all the criteria of uh, PWA? So there's a tool in Chrome, in the latest version, you don't need to do anything, just open your web page, go to developer console, go to audit and click perform audit. It will check your PWA and make sure it satisfies all the criteria and give you a score. So here, for this sample app, you have 73 out of 100. It will also tell what are the things checks are passed and what are the things fail and give you a hint how to improve your PWA. And these are the browser support. As in web, not every browser supports at the same time, so you have to live with it. But fortunately for PWA, so we have a wide variety of support. So let's say Apple Web Supported by all major browsers. Service so Browser supported by all major browsers. The Safari, they started submitting only as supporting only the latest version, which released in March 29. Before that, everybody was skeptical whether Apple will support or not support Service Worker because it may conflict with their app store revenue and other things. But yeah, it's supported it, so available in all major browsers. Web push notification. Safari has custom implementation of their own. And that's all the things for the users. And payment address, the silly development from Firefox. Okay, these are the early words in the PW journey. And you can see across all industries like yeah, uh, e commerce, news, uh, social media. Okay, credits. So you can find all the good resources from Google and uh, Mozilla. So yeah, so those are really good resources. It has all the code samples and it will walk through step by step. Please refer to those. That's all. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you enjoy and hope you will go on and keep Thank you so much.